All right. To answer Steven's question, the Tribro source is on GitHub now. I know after last year, probably my number one question was, how can I run that locally? So now you can run that locally. Uh, it's still probably 75% finished. It needs a bit of work, but you can get it running fairly straightforward. Um, basically, see, use these screenshots because I thought we might have networking problems and we're not having networking problems and now I wish I didn't have screenshots because I can't click on those links. Uh, bro, try bro. So basically, in theory, if you had a box running system D, you throw this service in place, reboot the box, and Tribo will come up when it reboots. So everything's in Docker, published. It's fairly easy to get running. The one kind of screwy thing is the way the PCAPs are handled. So if you try to rebuild it, you won't have the PCAPs, because I don't have the PCAPs in Git, because that would not be a good use of Git. Um, but if you just run the public one that has all the PCAPs in it, and you'll basically end up with a service exactly like the one we run, pretty much byte for byte identical, which is pretty awesome. We actually had moved it from Amazon to OSU OSL, and I don't think anyone noticed. It was really just deploy the new system, run the container, move DNS, and it started up on the new server. And it's about twice as fast. I don't know if anyone noticed in the last month or two, it got a lot faster. It was switching from Amazon to OSU. Um, so it's that. With that, all the Docker files I use to build Bro are also on GitHub as well. And the interesting thing about that is I have many versions, not just the latest version. So I took the time to get like Bro 1.5 working, which was not fun. Um, because you actually, it's actually a good use of Docker, because if you try to just build Bro 1.5 on a modern distribution, it just doesn't work. You get compiler errors and just random things fail. But if you use you know, two version old Linux container, it builds just fine. So all the Docker containers, are, all the bro containers have their own Docker file. So you can do some neat stuff like this, make this a little bigger. You can run in a for loop the last, what, seven years of bro versions all on one machine without conflicting. So one kind of fun thing to do on Tribro, I don't know if anyone's ever done this, to see how far we've come is, uh, I don't know, if I think that'll work, is load, say, the exercise example and run it on Bro 1.5 and marvel at the improvement in the log files. Like this was what the HTTP log used to look like, if you've never seen it. It is. Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah. It's a slightly different time, but yeah. It was optimized for much different, I think, in use compared to the one event per line that we have now. So yeah, it's kind of a different time machine. Um, but yeah, if you were wondering if something did or didn't used to work, you can see. Um, Oops, where's my presentation? So that's that, moving along. Um, one uh, neat thing I got working is, so Tribro is really just all JavaScript. There's a backend service that you post to with the code or the PCAP that you want, and it responds with the standard output and all the different files. One small tweak I made was enabling the cores, the cross-origin request sourcing or whatever it is, to make it even easier to do things like this which is just a standalone HTML file on a completely different web server with a couple of lines of jQuery. And this is uh, editable, by the way, which will post to the service and run that code. So with cores enabled, every blog or documentation out there can have runnable examples that post to Tribro and get the data back. So that really opens the door to a lot of cool things. The thing I actually want to copy is this. Uh, Mozilla has this really nice Rust by example documentation where all the examples are runnable. So we actually can build this now. How do you get log output in there? Um, like the, you select somewhere the log that you would like to get printed? Uh, yeah, that's, this is just output. So that works. I think it actually does give you all the data. It's just figuring out how to display it. 
On the Tribro site, there's lots of JavaScript and CSS to get the tabs so you can click between the files and render the tables. Oh, speaking of that, I almost forgot. So the one kind of new change to Tribro that I added recently that I think a lot of people may have missed, oops, is if we actually run a PCAP that has data, is on, say, like the HTTP log, you get these really long log lines, which are kind of hard to see, but now if you click them, it transposes it to a vertical table, and you can easily view the full values of all the table rows. So instead of trying to figure out you know, what that field is, now you can just click it and get the full record. So that's why doing this in the documentation would be a little tricky. Supporting things like that is a little harder than just, you know, hello world in a little box. Um, if anyone has ideas on how best to pick files in the output, it's probably the one thing that needs to be figured out. And then what we could probably do is go through all the bro documentation and make all the examples runnable, um, which is pretty neat. So there's that. Um, one other thing I started right after last BroCon was a new black hole router project, which from day one has had really great integration with Bro. So it's a project or two on GitHub. There's a project for the main website, which is primarily an API. It has a website that I can show in a second, but it's in a way a broker as well, because it's really just a website that has an API, Bro posts blocks to it, there's clients that pull down the blocks and push them to routers using BGP. But I spent a lot of time getting the Bro integration uh, really easy to use out of the box. So aside from defining the environment for where the web server is and your authentication token, that's all you have to do. Is you load it, you tell it which things you want to block, and it does the rest. So very easy to integrate and use. And I believe I am logged in, whoa, here. So I can show a quick demo of that. So it has a full web interface and everything along with the API. So if I go to my block list, you can see all these blocks that Bro has put in probably in the last 15 minutes. Actually, last one minute, lots of scans. Um, so yeah, the, the thing I was trying to go for this is to really, as much as I can, do a complete system. So it's the API with the web interface, with client libraries, Bro integration, pluggable backends. Um, so kind of really easy to fit into different environments and has all the pieces that you need. Like the web interface, since it uses Django with the REST framework, supports things like LDAP authentication for Active Directory. Uh, the API can use authentication tokens, so then you don't need to encode your Active Directory credentials in your Bro sensor. So there's lots of really kind of like the like 80-20 rule kind of thing. This is all the like 20% that's a pain. The actual API and the blocking is really the easy part. Getting all the little details to make it a complete system is where all the work comes from. So that's on GitHub. Um, one of the main things I need to work on is a little better documentation for because it it's a little tricky to get running. But if you wanted to get it running, just reach out to me. I could help you get that going. Um, so fuzzing. Uh, one thing I kind of wanted to do recently, it's you see it in the news all the time, is you know people are fuzzing things with great success, all these different libraries, finding all these bugs and fixing them. So let's fuzz bro. So I try it, and it does 1.8 executions a second, which is completely useless. So I put that on the table for a while. This was maybe six months ago. So very recently, the software, the AFL fuzzer, had this blog post, hey, new AFL persistent mode, where it'll run your binary, and basically you do a very strategic go-to to kind of get back to the beginning without exiting your tool and starting over from scratch. So I hacked up Bro a little, just a couple of minor changes, reordering some lines and putting in that strategic go-to. Result, 1,000 executions a second. Unfortunately, I never was able to get it to crash. Which, yes, yeah, <laughs> just because we know Bro has no crashing bugs left in it. So um, take three, which I need to start soon. So the biggest problem is it spends almost all its time testing the PCAP, because it is really dumb. It doesn't know anything. All it does is take your input file and screws with it until things happen. So it doesn't know what a TCP header is or an IP header 
or the PCAP header. So it just tries flipping those bytes to see if anything happens. There is uh, one thing I can show that I found. I think it's GCV down. One thing I did find is Bro has a bug, though I don't really blame it. If you have a PCAP file, and if you notice the timestamps there, go from three minutes to minus 13 hours. So clearly gibberish, but TCP dump clearly handles it fine. Bro, hangs. So there's a somewhat obscure bug in the packet input code where it, I guess, waits forever for the next packet because it thinks time is doing something strange. Try waiting 13 hours. <laughs> you know I didn't. <laughs> it, it does use a lot of CPU, so I think I think my laptop would not like that. Um, yeah, so yeah, it doesn't crash. So that was one of the, uh, the tweaks I made in the net was if this function gets called more than like a thousand times, just exit. Because all the PCAPs I was testing did not have a thousand packets. So it's really a kludge. If we can get that bug fixed, it'll be a little easier to fuzz things. But really what we need, which someone, I wouldn't be surprised, has this lying around, is just a binary that you give it the packet contents and it runs it through analyzers, skipping libpcap and all TCP reassembly. Because that code, from what I could tell, doesn't really crash. But to really hammer on the analyzers, you really don't want to run through all that other code. Plus, it would likely go twice as fast. So some C++ work to do a kind of analyzer testing binary will likely produce some interesting results. Or at least tell us that bro doesn't crash twice as fast. So, but slightly detour. I got really good at this fuzzing tool and how to build stuff. So I think, well, let's try something simple like BroCut. So did anyone notice in Bro 2.4 we ported BroCut to C? Did anyone notice BroCut got really fast? <laughs> yeah, so one thing I can quickly demo, I think I have it set up somewhere here. Got so many windows and such a tiny screen. So here's a box with some Bro logs. And if I just read them from disk after compressing them with the single threaded gzip, I get about 130 megabytes a second of just raw log data. If I pipe that through the old bro cut, asking for just the ID or JH, I can make that a little bigger, we get 4.8 megabytes a second. So about a, what, 30? time performance decrease over just reading the raw data to dev null. With the new and improved bro cut doing the exact same thing, no performance change. So extracting a single column pretty much as fast as you can read the logs. Granted, that is probably one of the best cases because one of the neat performance tricks we did is if the field you want is early on the line and you've seen that field, you don't need to look at the rest of the line which you think is silly, but one funny thing is you think, oh, well, I don't need bro cut, I'm just using cut, because cut is in C and cut is fast. You know, you use cut to get field four. Bro cut is still many times faster than cut. And if you read the source code, you'll see why, because cut tries to handle Unicode and just tons and tons of other uh, corner cases that will never happen in a bro log, where bro cut knows exactly what it should expect and it's even compared to cut a number of times faster. But we wrote it in C, and as you know, you know, C never crashes. So, and I wrote most of the code for it, so definitely didn't have any bugs. So let's run it at the fuzzer. And after about 20 minutes, it says that there's two crashes, which is not what I wanted to see. Um, looking at the files that it end up figuring out crash, uh, bro cut, two bugs out of all the different files. If you let it run for much longer, it'd find a lot of crashes, but they all boil down to two problems, which is a time that's way out of range, and if the header has a separator, that is the null character. We're just missing entirely. Apparently, strsep does not like it when you give it null as the character. Um, so with those two bugs fixed, we added them to the uh, test suite, and I tried fuzzing it again. I let it run overnight, no more crashing bugs. And so the interesting thing about how uh, AFL works is one of their examples is code like this, where you're saying, 
the buffer starts with F and then goes to O and then goes to O and then goes to exclamation point, that's when it crashes. What it actually does is it instruments the binary to figure out, hey, when that first character was F, like this code ran that didn't run before. And when the second character is O, well now this code runs. So it kind of keeps track of what it needs to do to get stuff to crash. And every time it manages to like flip a bit and a new code path is ran, it keeps track of that. So the interesting thing is, what it says is that there were 160 different code paths found. And on Tribro that, or on BroCut, that's about right. There's not that many different branches. But what's interesting is it was running for about 13 and a half hours. And the last unique path was almost 13 hours ago. So it actually only took about an hour to run through and figure out what it needed to change to exercise every code path in BroCut. Yes? What are the nine hangs? Um, nothing really. It's very aggressive on hangs. Like it auto probes in, I think it sets the timeout to like 20 milliseconds. So anytime the laptop blips, like some cron job runs, it thinks it timed out. So yeah, nothing to be uh, worried about. But yeah, so no more bugs in BroCut, at least according to the AFL fuzzer. And if anyone's wondering, as far as I know, none of these are uh, exploitable by anything because they're really just null pointer dereferences. So nothing like a buffer overrun. Um, and they're fixed now, so that's good. Um, how am I doing for time? That was all the slides I had put together. Oh, well, I got lots of time. Almost 20 minutes. Good, I can sort off some couple other things. Um, good, good. I just need to get my bearings here. Um, where is my window? Ah. So uh, at the Bros for Pros, I had demoed the StatsD plugin I wrote that the um, other people were using. And that's nice, but one thing I found was a lot of people were asking, you know, they were trying to use it, and it was a lot of components, and they liked the idea of the stats and how easy it was, but they didn't like that you had to run all this stuff. So I thought, well, you know, we have some stats, or wrong box, you know, can we leverage some stats to do the same thing? So I tried putting together, what did I call it, stats? Stat metrics. So if I can make this fit. So what I was able to do is use a very simple some stats uh, script, basically um, mirroring the same thing. You have a statistics and account. That's all you care about. And just create the giant sum stats. Very, very boilerplate, generic stuff. And then write this function, increment, with has a key and a value. So just like the StatsD plugin I wrote, but behind the scenes using some stats observe. So the interesting thing is, so you end up being able to run a test script like this, which looks just like the StatsD thing. So if you wanted to count your connection established, you just do stat metrics increment bro connection established one, connection rejected, bro connection rejected one. So exactly the same as the other plugin, just using bro, no external dependencies. Mm. And what you end up with uh, is, a, is a very simple stats log. Oops, not stats, stat, what is it called? Stat metrics, yes, I know what I call things. Which every 10 seconds is updated with those metrics. And then you can feed that into your Splunk or something else and have your much lower data volume, much easier to graph. Uh, data set. So I need I don't have that on GitHub currently, but it's a page of code. We really need the bro pan or whatever. Um, but yeah, so if you wanted to do really interesting counting metrics but didn't want to run a StatsD server or Graphite, this is possibly a really good middle ground. What I'm not sure is how low I could get that interval. I think 10 seconds might be even pushing it. Probably one second might break some stats. But 10 seconds seems to work pretty good on a reasonably sized cluster. Um, OK. Interesting thing. Uh, time. OK, lots of time. OK. Um, think for a second. Any questions so far while I think of the next thing? Oh, sorry. So on the 
issue where you have a negative timestamp on the PCAP. Yes. The TCP replay of that will grow with the OK at that point? I don't know. I'd have to try. I actually have no idea what that even looks like in the file. It's clearly just some random bits flipped. Or if you type it through, you speed dump it first. So if you speed dump and then write it to standard out and then read it in, grow. Uh, yeah, I wonder what TCP dump would even do. So that's hang.pcap if I write it to fixed.pcap. Oh, it's, not gonna, it's not going to do anything. No, yeah, it doesn't. Yeah. So it, it doesn't change it. But yeah, it'll be interesting to fix that bug. Um, I doubt it could ever occur in the wild because it's libpcap is what fills in those um, fields anyway. So. Oh, no, no, no. The clock jumps back. <laughs> yeah, sunspots. I've, I've seen clocks jump oh. major amounts. Yeah, but I mean, to get a negative time, I don't even know. This is relative, isn't it? You no. Run, like, TCP dump, run it dash TT. Oh, OK. TCB dump. Uh, that, that's not going to work. Yeah. Oh, yeah, of course. TT. Oops, wait, that's the one I deleted. Ah, OK, so it is so it actually went forward. a yeah, very large amount. Yeah. Huh, so I wonder. So is Bro just waiting 13 hours to show that package? Yeah, I mean, that's a that's a huge amount. So yeah. I no, I don't know. Yeah, but it's not waiting for it. It, it should. I mean, I'm it's not it's running it in the pseudo real time mode, so I don't know why it would wait. No, but I don't know what's going on. yeah. So in theory, I don't think that could happen in the wild, but it might well, be. Can move forward or back quite a bit. Yeah. Just due to no. somebody changing. I mean, for all we know, there's been some people having random bro hangs that could be caused by something like that. That's actually, it was in 61 years. 61 years? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, can't wait that long, but yeah, that's <laughs> it. Was it 2061 years? <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> interesting things, interesting. I got lots, don't worry. Um, uh, uh, one uh, neat script I have that's done wonders, uh, um, site, which I actually need to expand and publish again, is who's had fun with reflection attacks? Who, who has a bro policy that tells you anytime someone has a reflection, what's the word for that, victim? So one thing I found out, it, the script could actually probably be simplified because I did a lot of data mining to figure this out. And from what I could tell, if you simply just look for flows that started externally, are UDP where the inbound host sent more than a megabyte in response, it's an attack. So the script that I have has a con set of ports for DNS, NTP, SNMP, but I wondered, you know, do you even really need this restriction? So I did, I think, a couple of searches on you know a year's worth of bro con logs. And other than our DNS server and VPN box, nothing else ever tripped this. Like You'd think there would be other cases where people would have large UDP flows, but they really don't. So yeah, so very simple script that uses the, um, actually, I can use the new thing in row 2.4, I should port it before I publish it, the connection size monitor instead of using con polling. So it's a very simple script that all it does is it looks for UDP connections over a certain size from a certain port um, and finds every attack. Because at the time, I think someone published, here's a script that detects NTP. And I'm thinking, well, NTP is just one problem. You know, We could probably make it a little more generic. And this has found issues on most of those ports. So definitely making a dumber script that looks for a simpler thing has worked wonders. So this uh, finds many, many interesting things. And one interesting data point is we were doing monthly scans for NTP servers. And we would do a scan, find a bunch of NTP servers that were open, tell all the system hey, you guys got to fix this, pat ourselves on the back. Two days later, there'd be a reflection attack. And we'd be like, we don't understand. Like, we just ran a scan. There were no servers. So I started running scans every hour. So I wrote my own little scanner in Python to do scans. 
And we would find a server, you know, late Friday night, and I would see it. Like, okay, we have an open NTP server. We should fix that. We could wait till Monday morning, no big deal. Three hours later, it was being abused. So the time window from when you have a machine that someone puts online that's running, say, open NTP to when it's abused, you don't have time even to really scan it yourself. Someone else is scanning it for you. They'll tell you. So even, even trying to be proactive, it barely helps because even when we catch it hourly, unless we immediately block it, it will be abused. And part of the reason why I realized this to scan an entire slash 16 looking for open NTP servers from a cable modem connection a few states away takes like three minutes for one slash 16. So you can imagine you probably scan all of, you know, the, most of the higher ed address space in an hour. So there's really no barrier to entry whatsoever. So I hope to have this script published soon once I port it to the new feature. Did you run against a script that's all you need traffic? Not just the <coughs> port boundaries? Uh, Currently, the script is only running against those ports. I had done some data mining against our archived logs to see if I didn't have that restriction, what false positives would I have gotten? And it was VPN and DNS. Do you have any voice video? What do you mean? Uh, I would think a lot of that is, is being transported over UDP because it's connectionless and you don't want the overhead of TCP. So mm -hmm. if you're looking for a flow greater than 100 bytes in size, you can right. very well get that for voice and video coming back. Oh, well, you'd think, well, the filter I had used was, so the originating host was external, and the internal host is what responded with a lot of the data. And I think the reason why maybe it didn't trip is I think some of those video streams are unidirectional, where the sender connects and then sends all his video, where it's not that the sender connects and then the receiver, because it's connectionless, like you said, it's, it's the originator that's pushing all the data. When you have an originator that's pushing a small amount of data and the responder pushing a large amount of data, at least in our data, that does not happen, except VPN and DNS. So I'll probably port this to the new feature in 2.4 and take out the port restriction and let it run for a bit and see how it works. But it seems to be the much better approach than to try and handle NTP directly or try to handle SNMP directly, because there's going to be another thing. You know, every single UDP protocol, it seems, has a reflection issue these days. So tailoring the script to them individually seems like a losing battle. Question? Yeah, it might be, might be a losing battle unless you're fighting other battles where you need to know if it's a DNSSEC-caused issue. Mm -hmm. that's, that's kind of one of the things I'm worrying about. Possibly. I guess, yeah. All right, so that's that script. When am I supposed to be done? 4.15? Yep. Okay, a couple of minutes. A couple of minutes. Uh, do, 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 do. Okay. Geez, I thought I had too much material. I guess I've been talking very fast. Should I talk slower? <laughs> okay. Jeez, I know I have something else, something really cool. Mm hmm. Lost my window. Here it is. What do I got? What do I got? Hmm. Okay, maybe not here. Huh. Any other questions? Jeez. Well, people always do tell me I talk too much, so maybe I could finish early and people will be happy. On your black mobile routes stuff, how are you inserting the routes? Uh, so, so the interesting thing about the architecture is the server with the API is completely agnostic. It doesn't know anything about blocks. Um, so the kind of reference implementation that we're running is an exabgp-based exa client. So that just connects up to the API, requests a list of blocks and block updates, and pushes it out to a router using BGP. So. And the really neat thing about that is I have an edge router at home that speaks BGP that costs $100. So I have the project running at home on my internet connection, blocking a whole bunch of stuff on my $100 router, and it's running Illinois on the 100 gig routers, the exact same code base. So it's pretty neat that that works. Um, and yeah, so one of the things is since the server is kind of agnostic, it just kind of brokers the blocks. You can actually run multiple blockers. 
So we have redundant BGP peers, each peering with two routers. So it's a pretty scalable and resilient system. <laughs> yes. So, and yeah, if you didn't want to use BGP, you wanted to use IP tables or something, you write you know, 50 lines of code to pull down the box and add and remove IP tables rules. And every other component will work the same. Questions? You have a pointless functionality just in case. Yeah, uh, in the server management interface and also the API, you can add cider blocks to whitelist. And it's, it's funny, so this is kind of the third in iteration of a black hole router that I implemented. You think whitelists are great. We want a whitelist. We don't want to block any internal hosts, you know, because bro shouldn't be blocking them. And then you get an internal host doing NTP reflection and you want to block it. So. You know, just because it's the kind of thing that you need once you build this a couple times, there's a button to skip the whitelist. Because inevitably, you whitelist internal hosts and then you realize, no, wait, we really do want to block an internal hosts. So it's, it's a checkbox in the interface and it's a Boolean in the API. So bro generally does not set that. But from the command line, you could set the uh, set skip whitelist to true. The black hole router? Yeah, obviously not live data, but um, something. Actually, I could probably run the one at home, just push it on the cloud somewhere, just not let people block things on my connection. But yeah, um, yeah, I, I could see about doing that. Um, uh, one thing I realized is Heroku supports this like deploy to Heroku button. So I'm, that might be a stopgap measure, so I don't have to pay for it. So you could click one button and deploy it to Heroku for you. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been about a year's work into this right now, kind of on and off. Most of the work is in the API in the back end, so the web interface is kind of sparse. But you know, like you can query uh, like 1.0.0 .0 .0 slash 6, or is that going to find anything? I know they recently reallocated that. Ah, yes. So you search by CIDR, lots and lots of records. Bro is fairly active pushing uh, scan blocks into this. Oops. But. Have you considered uh, multiple lists and override lists? Um, no. BSD SPAMD offers that option, and I've used it heavily. Yeah. It doesn't do multiple whitelists. Is it, so the whitelist is hooked up to the API, so you could, if you wanted to, feed a lot of lists into it. Um, but yeah, that's probably making it. That almost sounds like you'd want it to be like multi-tenant. Yeah. But no, have not. That's probably would get into kind of the too complicated realm. Like as complicated as it is, I did try to keep the scope relatively straightforward. It has an API with a block function. You call block. It's in the database. Client pulls it down. Calls set blocked. Anything more complicated than that would probably kind of get feature creep. Question. Attacker knows, um, you know, say you visit Google all the time or something, and then they spoof their address as Google or another provider. Well, then you just start blacklisting yourself from going out to those websites. Right. So that's not so much an issue with the black hole router as like in the bro side of things. Generally, what we do is we're very aware of things like that. So we try to avoid auto blocking on things like UDP because we know it can be spoofed and try to prefer only blocking TCP based things. Is the appropriate amount of time after all? Just, just. Ah, one more question. The, uh, the negative time is because the timestamp field, I just looked at the uh, header file, is a signed value. Ah. Which doesn't make sense in that context, but that's what it is. So, so probably also a bug in TCB dump after all that it's, or <gasps> bug in STRF time or something like that? Yeah, it's actually it's All right. So apparently, very, very, very large timestamps in PCAP files cause weird bugs in different tools. So, Alrighty, I think that's all I have for this year. Thanks, Justin. Sure.